Corey Borger, with his combined talents as fly fishing instructor, angling author, fly tire, and professor of biology, has become one of today's most respected fly fishermen. In this tape, Gary will share his experience and intimate knowledge of the sport with you. He'll discuss equipment and knots, and show you how to cast and quickly locate the best places to fish. You'll learn proven methods for taking fish with dry flies, nymphs, and streamers, and how to avoid common angling mistakes. When you apply the concepts you learn in this tape to the waters you fish, you'll find yourself catching more and bigger trout. Fly fishing is an exciting and productive way to take trout. And it's a lifetime sport in which you can become totally involved. All you need to get started is a rod and reel, a line, a leader and some flies. And then there's the fun of learning about the fish and its food organisms, the satisfaction of tying your own flies to match the hatch, and the subtleties of casting and presentation and reading the water. Of course, there's the, the thrill when the fish takes the fly and the excitement of the fight and the gratification you get from releasing a nice fish like this to fight another day. Fly fishing began as a method for catching trout. But over the centuries, it's come to encompass all other species. The modern fly fisher can angle for such diverse fishes as oh, bass and bluegills or tarpon and bonefish. Really, the limits to fly fishing are the waters you fish. While I'll be fishing for trout in this tape, the concepts and techniques I show you can be readily adapted to other species. Artificial flies can be tied to directly imitate food items of the fish, or perhaps only generally suggest food items. The major food items of the fish are aquatic insects, crustaceans, and other fishes. The four major aquatic insects are mayflies, midges, caddisflies, and stoneflies. They spend the majority of their lives underwater and only a short period as a winged adult. You can quickly learn to identify the aquatic forms by simply picking up rocks from the stream and noting the insects clinging onto them. Here on this spring creek, there are abundant populations of mayflies. This is a mayfly nymph. Mayfly nymphs can be distinguished by the presence of only one visible pair of wing pads and gills along the sides of the abdomen. These insects can be found in all water types. Any fly that imitates a specific insect should be selected to match the size, shape, and color of the natural. This would be a good choice to match this mayfly nymph. At maturity, the nymph swims to the surface and the adult emerges. When such a hatch is in progress, there's a large amount of food either right on or just under the surface film, and the trout move up and feed eagerly. If the hatch is heavy, then the trout become selective and feed only on that insect. Other food items are ignored. Such selective behavior provides one of the great challenges of fly fishing, matching the hatch. During the time that the adult insect is crawling from its husk, it can't swim or fly away, and so it's very vulnerable. Now, because the trout has to get more energy from the food item that it's getting than energy required to catch that food item, it often takes these very vulnerable emergers. Often the secret to fishing to highly selective trout during a hatch is to fish with an emerger imitation. A simple soft hackle fly such as this is very effective during the hatch because it gives the impression of the rumpled appearance of the partially emerged adult. The fully emerged mayfly is called a dun because it often has gray-brown wings. The body is usually a dull brown, gray, olive, or yellow. This adult is easily recognized since it holds its wings upright over its back, giving it the appearance of a tiny sailboat. When you're selecting flies to imitate duns, you have to consider where they'll be fished. Flies to be fished in very riffly water should have plenty of hackle on them to keep them afloat. Since the choppy currents make it hard for the fish to see the fly clearly, such overdressing is not detrimental. But in slow, flat water, the fish has plenty of time to inspect the fly and can see it very well. Flies for this water must be a more accurate copy of the natural and should be dressed more delicately than fast water flies. Fish take the duns and the emergers with a strong rise that often leaves a bubble behind. 
They don't leave a bubble if they're taking nymphs just under the surface. When the hatch is going on, a rise with a bubble in it is a good target for your dry fly. Mayflies are the only aquatic insects that have two adult stages. The dun flies to the streamside vegetation where it rests for a period of from a few minutes to up to a few days. Then it molts, shedding its outer skin to become the sexually mature spinner. This stage has glassy wings and a shiny body. The spinners mate and the females drop to the water, lay their eggs, and die. As they do, their wings fall out to the sides. They're then called spent spinners. A fly pattern with hackle wound at the front and then trimmed top and bottom is an excellent match for the spent spinner. If the spinner fall is very heavy, the trout rise to them freely. However, because the spent spinners ride so low in the water, the trout's rise to them is very gentle and often no bubble is left behind. Many anglers fail to notice the spinners in the film and misinterpret such rises as those of nymphing trout that are feeding just below the surface. Look to see if there are spent spinners flush in the film before you cast. Observation is one of the keys to success in fly fishing. Many times when you get to the river, there aren't any fish rising, and so it's not obvious where they are. In this case, you've got to be able to locate the places where fish are holding and feeding. Such places are called lies. All lies have to provide protection from swift currents. A sheltering lie, in addition, provides protection from predators. In a riffle like this, the obvious sheltering lie is the deepest part, right down in there. Also, the many weed beds that we see in here can provide shelter for the fish. Feeding lies are places where fish can find food, but they don't get much protection from predators. This flat that I'm standing in is a very good place for fish to move into and feed. But an even better place is across on the other side of this current tongue where all the little eddies are swirling out. Because as food comes floating down the current, it'll swirl out into these small eddies and the fish can hold beside the fast current and pick off all that food coming down. Prime lies are places where fish can find food and protection from predators simultaneously. In riffly water like that, where the surface is all broken, fish feel protected because they can't see out well, predators can't see in well. If the riffle is more than about oh, knee deep, then I'd consider the whole thing a prime lie. However, you have to remember that fish are not going to expend a lot of energy to come to the surface through all that fast water. If the water is more than about waist deep, I would consider it a prime lie for nymph fishing, but not really a prime lie for dry fly fishing. If it's anywhere from knee deep up to waist deep, the fish will come up through that, and I would consider that a prime lie for dry fly fishing. You have to know where lies are, not only to find the fish, but to plan your strategy in playing the fish. And you should be able to figure out where the best lies are because the best lies, the one that has the most food, the best protection, and so on, will always hold the biggest fish. Earlier today, I sampled this riffle and found lots of these pale morning dun mayfly nymphs. As you can see, there's no mayflies hatching now, so this would be a very good time to fish with an imitation of these nymphs. Mayfly nymphs are not very good swimmers, so a very effective way to fish them is to simply cast them upstream and allow them to drift back to you at the same speed as the current. You can do this quite nicely with a roll cast. All casts, including the roll cast, can be built from an understanding of the basic casting stroke. To begin this, just relax your arm at your side, bring your forearm up until it's parallel to the ground, cup your fingers, and put your thumb on top. From this position, we're going to make the back stroke. Lift the hand back and up, in a straight line. Watch my elbow, it comes up and slightly forward. When your hand is about even with the side of your face, you're gonna stop and let your wrist tip back just slightly until the thumb is pointing straight up. On the forward stroke, the hand is brought down and forward. Notice my elbow will also have to drop and go back. Down and forward with the hand. When it's about halfway back down, we're going to stop and let the wrist tip forward. Once you understand that and can do it, you can cast. So I would recommend that you practice this basic casting stroke without the rod and line. Just run through the motions until it feels very comfortable.
Effective casting requires more than just an understanding of the basic arm movements. It also requires a balanced system. For trout fishing, I like a rod that's eight to nine feet long. It takes a six weight line. Let me string up my rod and I'll show you the roll cast. As I pull the leader off, I like to stretch it. Just pull it like this to take the kinks out of it. And then I pull off enough line to go up through all the guides. Fold the fly line over just behind the leader and run that up through the guides. This way, if you should drop it, the line won't slip back. Pull out about 20 feet of line, pull it all out through the rod and lay that down on the water and you're ready to begin the roll cast. Hold the rod comfortably in your hand with your thumb on top, put the line under a finger of your rod hand and then go right through that basic casting motion. Lift up and back slowly, stop, let your wrist tip back until your thumb is pointing straight up. The line should be hanging straight down from the tip of the rod like that. Then move down and forward and stop hard and let your wrist tip forward. Lift up and back. Stop, let the rod tip back. Allow the line to hang straight down from the tip of the rod. Should be slightly behind your shoulder. Move down and forward and stop hard. And the line rolls right out just like that. Let me show you some common mistakes that people make roll casting. The first one is that they bring the line up too fast, like this. Obviously, you can't make a good roll cast with a line back there. The second common mistake that people make is taking the rod back too far. Bring it up smoothly, but then you tip your wrist way back like that. Obviously, you can't make a good roll cast with your wrist. And the third mistake that people make is bringing the rod forward too quickly. You want to start very smoothly. If you start very quickly, the line jumps way up in the air like that, and obviously you can't make a good roll cast either. Let me show you how to do this roll cast in slow motion. You're going to lift smoothly, wait for the line to skate to you until it's hanging straight down from the rod tip just behind your shoulder, move down and forward, stop hard, and a nice roll cast. Well, I think we're ready to start fishing. This is the nymph I'm going to use right here, and I'll tie it to the leader with an improved clinch knot. Let me show you this knot with a demonstration rope kit. This is my secret fly for spring creek fishing. Big fly for big fish. To tie the fly on, run the tippet through the eye of the fly, twist it about five times back on itself, then run the end of the tippet through that opening right by the eye of the fly, and then back through this opening. Then moisten that with a little saliva, otherwise you'll burn the leader as you pull it tight and then simply draw it down until it's tight. To complete the improved clinch knot, take your fingernail clippers and cut off the short end right up tight against the knot. There are some advantages to fishing upstream in the riffle. First of all, you're behind the fish, so it makes it difficult for them to see you. Second of all, the fish has to look out through a small area called a window. And in this broken surface, the window is all choppy, and so that adds to the fish's uh, inability to see you. Third, the rushing sound of the water muffles your wading sounds. In fact, this is the reason why so many anglers do so well in riffly water. The fish can't hear you, can't see you. If you're having problems fishing down on the flat, move up into the riffle. It might be the advantage that you need. Now, when you fish riffles, the temptation is to make just a couple of casts and say no fish and move on again. But a much better approach is to very systematically cover the riffle. And I use what's called the shotgun tactic for this. Pick out a block of water about 10 by 10 feet in front of me, upstream about 10 feet, and fish that area intensively. Maybe make 20, 30 casts into that area. Just roll cast the line up, and as it floats back to you, lift the rod. And when the fly is through that area that you want to fish, just bring it back and make another roll cast right back upstream again. And I just keep roll casting up into that position till after I've made maybe 20, 30 casts into one spot, and then I'll move over or move up a little bit, take another 10-foot block, and put 20, 30 casts into that. If you see a lot of fish rising and working in an area, I might even cast more than 20 or 30 times. The leader you use for this tactic should be 10 to 12 feet long and have a three to four foot tippet. This allows the fly to sink quickly and stay down. The tippet is the forward part of the leader. 
It comes in different sizes, which are designated with an X number. The X refers to the diameter. The larger the X number, the smaller the diameter. 3X through 6X are the most used sizes. You can readily determine the correct tippet size to use by dividing the fly's hook size by 3. The fly I'm using is a 16, so the correct tippet size is 5X. As you change flies, the tippet gets shorter. If it gets shorter than about 2 feet, you'll have to add a new one. The surgeon's knot is a strong, easily tied knot for adding the tippet to the leader. Let me demonstrate it with my rope kit. We'll pretend that the blue rope is the tippet and the white rope is the leader. We place them going in opposite directions and simply tie an overhand knot, pulling through the short end of the leader and the long end of the tippet. And then through one more time. It's just a double overhand knot is all it is. Then hold all four ends, turn the knot over, put a little saliva on it to lubricate it so you don't burn it when you pull it up, and then pull on all four ends to pull it tight, pull the two long ends, pull the two short ends to make sure everything's snug, then clip off the short ends right against the knot, and the surgeon's knot is completed. As the line comes back to me, I have to watch the end of the fly line to see the take. If a fish should grab the fly, the fly line's going to jump upstream. But because I'm using this fairly long leader, a better way to see the take is to use a little strike indicator. The strike indicator that I'm using is a piece of specially made fluorescent orange fly line. You slip it onto the leader before you tie on the fly, and then simply slide it up and slip it over a knot. I usually slip it up on the leader about three, four feet from the fly. This way I can see the take a lot sooner than if I were watching the tip of the fly line. Just gonna roll cast that up, watch that strike indicator. If it darts forward or stops, then I simply set the hook. Simply keep casting it up there and watching that indicator. Make sure you raise the rod as you as the line comes down to you. If you forget to raise the rod, you get a big pile of line on the water in front of you, and that makes it very, very difficult to set the hook. Come on, fish. There he is. When you're playing fish in fast water like this, you dare not pull too hard or you'll tear the hook out or break the tippet off. So just put gentle pressure on the fish. And I like to play the fish from the reel. I don't like to just strip in line. If you strip line and then step on it or something the fish makes a run, it'll break off. So pick the line up on the reel and play the fish from the reel. This is a pretty decent fish. Ooh, look at him go. Holy cow. Boy, when they get in that heavy current like that, they can put a lot of pressure on you. It's just a matter of waiting them out. There he goes, backing down. When the fish is in heavy water like this, don't pull too hard on it, because if you do, you tear the hook out or break the tippet off. Just keep smooth, even pressure on the fish, just like that. You don't have to hold the rod over your head. He's trying to get in that weed bed. Put it to whatever side gives you the best advantage. Try to keep the fish on a short line as possible. If it gets a long line, it's likely to go anywhere. If you keep it on a short line, you can keep side pressure on it like this. Make it go where you want. Out of that weed bed. Showing obvious signs of being tired now, and it's about time I think we net it. I like to net fish in fairly deep water, about knee deep if I can, in slow water. That way the fish doesn't panic. Just put the net in, lead the fish to the net head first, and then scoop it smoothly. That's all there is to it. Then we just very gently back the hook out, hold that fish down in the slow currents like this until it feels strong enough to swim away, and there he goes. While the roll cast is very useful for fishing a nymph upstream, that's certainly not the only use for this cast. It's useful in a lot of other angling situations. For example, when you have brush close behind you like this, it would prevent other kinds of casts. The roll cast still can be used. The pale morning dun mayflies are hatching now, so I've taken off the nymph and put on a dry fly. While you can fish a dry fly upstream with a roll cast, I prefer to use the overhead cast. It's more accurate, allows me to cast a little further, and doesn't get the fly as wet as the roll cast does. The overhead cast uses the same basic casting motion as the roll cast, except now we have to lift fast enough to get the line up in the air. So we're gonna begin with a smooth, slow motion, then accelerate very quickly and stop sharply in this position. 
then pause for just a second so the line has a chance to straighten out behind, move down and forward just like we did with the roll cast, and stop in this position. Just like this. Pause, smoothly forward. Lift smoothly, stop, down and stop. After the line straightens out, you can drop the rod tip if you want. Lift, stop, wait, smoothly forward, stop. You've got to start very smoothly, and then stop sharply. There are some common mistakes that people make with the overhead cast. The first of these is trying to pick the line off the water too quickly, so it rips off like that. Obviously, that'll spook any fish in the area. The other common mistake is taking the rod back too far, like this, and that throws the line on the water behind you. I guess if you want to catch fish back there, that's fine. The other mistake is not waiting long enough. Buggy whipping. If you can afford to pay $2 for every fly you crack off, that's fine also. Then the other mistake, and probably the one that most people make, is starting forward too quickly, kicking the rod, hitting it like that hard, bang like that. The line jumps down, ties a knot right in the leader for you. Start forward very smoothly, smoothly, smoothly. The secret to good casting is casting smoothly. Now let's see if we can get a fish. Remember, because we're fishing in a riffle, we can get quite close to the fish. So if you see one rise, work up to within about 25 feet of it before you make your cast. Fish feeding on dry flies in a riffle like this are watching a rather narrow current lane called the feeding lane. It may only be a few inches wide, so you want to try to put it right straight upstream from the fish. Cast it upstream about four feet from where you see the fish rise. Remember, the water's moving, so when you see the rise, the rise form is going to drift toward you, so the fish is actually upstream a little bit further than you think it is. One very good place to find feeding lanes in Riffley water is sort of at the edge of the heavy current tongues like this, where the insects spin out. I'm using a leader that's 10 to 12 feet long, and it has about a 3 or 4 foot tippet on it, so I get a very nice natural drift with the fly. Just cast it up there and allow it to drift down naturally, just like that. Watch that fly on the water. If you see the fish take it, just lift the rod until you feel the weight of the fish, and then back off. Now, when you're fishing in fast water like this, you have to do something with all the slack line that's drifting back toward you. So I use a method I call line control. Let me show you how to do that. After you've made the cast, simply transfer it from your line hand under a finger of your rod hand and strip in the line at the same rate as it's coming back toward you. Then you have to shoot the line back out. You do that after you stop the rod in the forward motion. Stop the rod, let go of the line, it'll shoot right through your hand, transfer it under this finger, and bring it back at the same speed that the current's carrying it down to you. Make sure you make a smooth transfer from hand to hand. Don't go like this. Not only does it look awkward, it's very ineffective and you've got to look at your hands, and as soon as you look at your hands, the fish is going to take your fly. This way you can cast, transfer, strip. You never have to look down at your hands. You can be watching out there to see if a fish takes the fly. After you've been fishing with a dry fly for a while, it tends to pick up water and get wet, so you need a fast, efficient way to dry the fly off. Best way to do this is with false casting. We're going to keep the line in the air and shake the water out of the fly. Use exactly the same casting motion that you would use for the overhead cast, but don't allow the fly to fall on the water. After you've made several casts and the fly is dry, you can put it right down again. A couple of other very useful uh, reasons for false casting are, first of all, to change direction. You can simply false cast around like this if you see a fish rising and cast over there. Another very useful reason for false casting is to lengthen line. Each time I bring the rod forward, I can simply shoot a little bit extra line like this. Hey, there's a fish. Let's see if we can get to that one. He's looking, he's looking, he's got it. It's a pretty good fish, too. Woo! Like riffles, pools have sheltering lies, feeding lies, and prime lies. There are feeding lies down in the tail of the pool. The deep water in the center of the pool is a sheltering lie. There are feeding lies along the edge of these current tongues, and prime lies up at the head of this pool, like I pointed out earlier, for the riffle. 
You can't always fish up with a stream with a dry fly. Sometimes you have to fish across the current. So let me show you how to do that. If you cast a dry fly straight across stream like that, the line will fall on the fast water, the fly will land on slow water over in those feeding lies, and then the line will pull the fly out of there and cause it to drag. That's an unnatural movement and the fish will refuse the fly. The solution to this is to mend the line. The best mend is a reach mend. I'm just going to cast out and then reach the rod upstream so that the line lands on the fast water upstream of the fly. This prevents drag. If you want to get a little more line out there, you can make that reach mend, and then just about the point where you think the fly is going to drag, you can make an on-the-water mend, throwing the line back upstream like this, and you can add a little more line to it, just pull it off the reel and shake it out into the current. And that gives you a nice, long, drag-free float. The spinners are falling, so I've come down here to the tail of the pool to try for some feeding fish. There are only feeding lies in the tail of the pool, so the fish here are going to be very spooky, and I have to approach them carefully and cast delicately. I can't approach from downstream because then I'd be casting up over that riffle. My fly would land on slow water, my line would land on fast water, and I'd get dragged immediately. So I'm going to cast down and across stream. This will put the fly and the line and the leader all on one current speed. However, I can't just cast straight down or I'll get drag also because the water is sliding under the fly. So I'm going to use a parachute mend. To do this, you make a normal cast and then draw the rod back just before it hits the water. Then all you have to do is lower the rod tip as the line goes downstream and you can float that fly right over top the fish. Simply make a normal cast and then draw the rod back just before the line hits the water. And then as the fly runs downstream, simply lower the rod, keep pace with it. Sometimes you have to move the fly a little bit to get it right into the fish's feeding lane because you can't always cast as accurately as you need to. All you have to do is cast well above the fish, skate the fly a little bit to slide it right into the fish's feeding lane, then draw, drop the rod tip, run that fly right down to the fish. This down and across tactic is the best technique there is for fishing to leader shy trout, whether it be in the tail of a pool like this, or in a riffle, or in a big flat. Come on, fish. Got him. Right in the tail of that pool. Looks like a brown. All right, it's nice to be able to fool those smart old brownies. Just down and across approach, getting that fly into the fish before the line and leader will do it every time. Oh, it is a brown and he's a jumper too. Nice fish. Not ready yet. Here he comes. You know, as important as mayflies are, they're only part of the fabric that's the food web of the trout. These tiny insects, the midges, are another thread in this biological mosaic. The midges have a life cycle that is different than that of the mayflies. There is a worm-like larva which develops to maturity in a few weeks. Though small, these insects are enormously abundant in lakes and streams throughout the range of the trout. In slow water areas, they can be the dominant trout food. Trout are well acquainted with this small but copious fare. This bare bones fly, the South Platte Brassy, and these dubbed fur imitations are very good representations of the larva. At maturity, the larva metamorphoses to become a pupa. This process takes a few days. The mature pupa then swims to the surface where the adult emerges. 
This is the time of the midge's life when it's most vulnerable to feeding trout. Now, this life cycle is the same as that of the butterfly. The caterpillar is a larva, and the chrysalis is a pupa. When the midges are hatching, the pupa form a raft of tiny morsels for the feeding trout. They are so abundant that the fish has little trouble finding enough to eat. The trout also become highly selective. But since the trout must feed very often to get enough pupa, you have many opportunities to fool the fish. This dubbed sparkle yarn pattern fished just under the film is very effective for taking midging trout. Adult midges look like thin mosquitoes with long bodies and short wings. Trout take the emerger and the adult just as readily as they'll take the pupa. This pattern, the Griffith's gnat, is the best fly I know of to mimic these stages. It can be left full to imitate the adult or trimmed flat on the bottom to represent the emerger. The rise to midges is slow, deliberate, and gentle. Often you'll see the fish's head and then its dorsal fin, and then its tail as it rises to take these tiny insects from the film. The English have called this head and tail rise a smutting rise. The presence of adult midges over the water and smutting trout should be your clues that some excellent midge fishing is at hand. Because the midges are so small and the fish's rise is so gentle, it's very difficult to tell whether fish are taking pupa or whether they're taking the adults. But if you watch very closely at a feeding fish, you can often see it pick an adult off the surface if it is, in fact, taking adults. These fish seem to be taking pupa right now, so I'm going to fish a pupil imitation just under the surface. The best tactic for this is the greased leader tactic. With this tactic, we just grease the leader with fly floatant. Just take some fly floatant, put it on your finger, and grease up the leader with it. Now, I start back about uh, eight or 10 inches from the fly when I'm fishing with a pupa. If I was fishing with a larval imitation, I wanted it to get a lot deeper. Then I would start back maybe three, four feet from the tippet and grease that whole leader right up, all the way to the end. So it floats right up on the surface, real high. We're gonna watch the leader, use it as a strike indicator. All right, let's see if we can get down here and get one of these fish. In this very flat water like this, I'm using a long leader about 12 feet, and I have a three or four foot tippet on it so that I don't get any drag at all. And I like to cast up and across stream with this tactic, using the overhead cast, not the roll cast. The roll cast makes too much of a disturbance on the surface. And as the fly drifts back down, I use the stripping technique that I showed you earlier just to pick up the slack. And if the fish doesn't take the fly, just pick it up and cast it out again. I'm watching the track of the leader on the surface. If it should draw under very sharply, then I'm gonna set the hook. Now, I like to use this technique for midge pupae and midge larvae, but it's not obviously restricted to those techniques or to those flies. You can use it for caddis pupa. You could use it for mayfly nymphs. Any insect that's floating along underneath the surface. And when I'm fishing up and across like this, I lay that fly about four or five feet above the fish so that it has a chance to get through the film and sink down those four or five inches where I want it. There, nope, got a weed instead. Well, sometimes you get weeds. Got to expect those kind of things. Anytime that tip goes under, set the hook because usually it's a fish. There it goes, got him. Good run. Get the rod down there. Pressure on it. This is where the value of a good reel comes in. One that turns very smoothly when that fish is running off line against the reel. If that reel turned the least bit harsh at all, break that fine tippet right off. I also like to have a reel that has capacity for at least 50 yards of backing, so if I get a really big fish that tears off a lot of line, you got some insurance. Come on, fish. Come on around here. Ah, oh, it's a nice rainbow. Come on. Get him in the net. Yeah, with that greased leader tactic, it's in the bag. Oh, look at the colors on that fish. What a lovely fish. Back in here.
when you're releasing a fish like this, if he's tired, you have an obligation to that fish to hold it until it's strong enough to be able to swim away. I just hold him like this in the water, face him upstream, and in slow current, don't get him in too fast current, or they'll tumble and get their nose down and get silt in their gills. Just hold them like this until they feel strong enough to swim out of your hands, and let them go. Looks good. Midges are very important in still water areas such as beaver ponds or lakes. The angling tactic for these areas are the same as for any flat water areas with one important exception. Because the current is so sluggish, the fish don't hold in one spot and wait for their food. They cruise about looking for it. In these areas, you've got to look for cruising lanes, not holding lies. These occur mostly at edges, along a weed bed, where shallows drop off into deep water, along steep banks, and so on. If you see fish feeding in such areas, cast the fly ahead of them. If you cast to the rise, you're casting where the fish was, not where it is. In shallow flats, trout will often cruise at random, taking nymphs from the bottom or floating insects from the surface. If you can see the fish, cast out well ahead of it so that it can come to the fly. But if the fish are just rising at random, the best thing to do is to cast the fly out, leave it sit out there for 30 or 40 seconds, then make another cast. Hopefully the fish will find the fly while it's just sitting there. I see one coming. He's looking. He's got it. Oh, boy, did he take that. Nice fish. Oh, boy. And a fish, oh, that's the end of that one. Well, when a fish jumps like that, you gotta give him lots of slack. And he was tight on the line, I gave him all the slack I could, and he still broke me off. That's the way it goes sometimes. Some days you see fish rising and there aren't any apparent hatches. Many times these fish are feeding on terrestrial insects that have either fallen or been blown from vegetation near the stream. Be especially mindful of this on windy summer days. Ants, jacids, beetles, inchworms, and grasshoppers can all be blown onto the stream or lake from overhanging trees and shrubs or nearby grasses and weeds. The rise to small terrestrial insects is soft and plucking much like the rise to midges or mayfly spinners. But the rise to grasshoppers and large beetles is bold and often very violent. Believe me, such rises can be startling and unnerving. In flat water, the terrestrials float and the imitations are fished like any dry fly. In riffles, however, the insects are often drowned and so the imitation should be fished upstream in a dead drift fashion. Some days when you're out fishing, you just don't see any surface activity. That doesn't mean the trout aren't alert for food. In many streams, the fish are very surface conscious and watch the film for food that may be floating by. During these blank periods, many anglers will fish the water with a dry fly, casting to good feeding lies and prime lies in hopes of luring a watchful trout. Terrestrial patterns are especially good for this tactic when fishing smooth flows. In Riffley water, a bushy fly such as this Adams, or these wolf flies is a good choice. But trout also feed on subaquatic organisms during these non-hatch periods. In fact, as much as 90% of the trout's diet consists of subsurface forms. You might select an imitation of a mayfly nymph or other aquatic insect and fish it dead drift with the upstream approach like I showed you earlier. Or you might select an imitation of a critter such as a scud. It's the most important of the freshwater crustaceans and occurs in trout waters everywhere. Imitations of these swimming organisms should be fished with an active retrieve. To fish these particular imitations, we want the fly to move. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that water moves, and we're going to adapt our techniques to allow the moving water to move the fly. One way to do this is simply to cast across stream and allow the pressure of the current to swing the fly back to you. This is called the down and across approach. Just cast across like that and let the pressure of the current swing the fly back. And I just jiggle the rod tip a little bit, maybe to give it some action. I'm casting across a current tongue here because fish, if they're in feeding positions, will be on either side of this current tongue and I can swing the fly right across them. 
just like that. Now, when you're using this technique, the fly obviously rides just under the surface. It doesn't get down too deep. I might also want to use a technique where I can get the fly very deep and then make it swim up like it might be a, a caddis pupa, for example, ascending to the surface. Well, the lising ring lift is a very good technique to do that. For this technique, you cast upstream and allow the fly to sink as it comes down. Well, as the fly comes down, you have to lift the rod tip, otherwise you'll get a belly on the line, which would pull the fly to the surface. If the fly passes your position, lower the rod tip, and then hold it when it gets to the down to cross position, and allow the fly to swing across to your side. This lifting lifts up the belly of the line so we don't get any drag and allows the, fl the fly a time to sink. Then we lower it, the fly is still sinking. Now the fly is as deep as it's going to get. When I stop the rod, the fly swings across and comes up to the surface. In wind like this, you have to cast a little bit harder than you normally would, and you might want to shorten your leader down to, oh, eight feet or so to help you get that line out there. Just cast up and across, lift as the line comes down, and lower the rod tip as the line passes your position. Even when it isn't the best of weather, with these techniques, you can still take fish. Doesn't want to just come in and be netted. That's a nice trout. This lising ring lift and down and across approach for active flies will work on any stream, even big rivers. This is a freestone stream. That is, it has a rocky bottom, a riffle pool configuration, and as you can see, obviously fast currents. These kind of rivers are found all over the country. The tactics that I showed you for the Spring Creek will work here when the fish are feeding under similar circumstances. Now, in addition to having good populations of mayflies and midges, these kind of streams also have very good populations of caddisflies. The life cycle of the caddis is like that of the midges. The larva is a worm-like creature that often builds a case of gravel or sticks in which to live. Rough dubbed patterns such as this are good choices to match the cased larva and can be fished successfully with the upstream shotgun tactic. The larva takes about a year to mature, and then it seals itself inside the case and metamorphoses to the pupa. The pupa requires another, well, oh, about two weeks to mature. When the pupa's mature, it cuts its way out of the case, drifts along the bottom for a while, and then ascends rather rapidly to the surface. Once it gets to the surface film, the adult breaks out of the pupal husk quite quickly and flies off. Trout grab and bite at the emerging insects with a splashy, showy rise that often leaves several bubbles. Sometimes a fish will jump clear out of the water in its haste to capture the escaping pupa. This soft tackle fly, tied with sparkle yarn, is an excellent choice to mimic the pupa. And the lising ring lift I showed you earlier is probably the best way to simulate its drifting and then ascending behavior. Adult caddisflies look much like small moths when you see them flying about. When resting, however, they hold their wings in a tent-like fashion over their back. Trout take these adult caddisflies both when they're hatching and when they come back to lay eggs. Because the adults often skitter around over the surface, the trout take them with the same splashy rise as they would emerging pupa. This elk hair caddis and this humpy are very good patterns to imitate the adults on fast water. These more delicately dressed patterns are better for slow water. You can fish imitations of adult caddisflies upstream in a typical dead drift manner, but you might also want to fish them with a little bit of action to simulate the dancing adult. Probably the best way to do this is to fish across or down and across. If you're fishing across stream, uh-oh, be careful of the bushes. <laughs> now, as I was saying, <clears throat> You can fish adult caddisfly patterns upstream in a dead drift fashion like you would other dry flies, but you might also want to give them a little bit of action. The best way to do this is to fish them either across or down and across. If you're fishing across, use that reach men to get the line upstream, and then as the fly goes down, just give it a few little twitches to dance it on the surface like that. But the best way really is to fish down and across with it, 
cast down, use the parachute, and then drop the fly on the surface. As it runs down, just stop the rod tip, and that'll dance the fly right up on the surface and look just like an egg laying or hatching adult. Trout usually take this dancing imitation with a rather violent rise, so you gotta be ready. While caddisflies are very important on freestone streams, in heavy flows like this, there are also good populations of stoneflies. These insects, like the mayflies, have only a nymphal and adult stage. The nymph can be recognized by the presence of two pair of wing pads and the lack of gills along the sides of the abdomen. They vary in size from about a half an inch to as much as two inches and live from one to three years. At maturity, the nymph crawls from the water before the adult emerges. Thus, there is no need for an emerging stonefly artificial. However, trout take the nymphs readily, and since the insects are poor swimmers, a nymph pattern such as this should be fished dead drift along the bottom. If you're fishing stonefly nymphs dead drift in shallow water, such as you might do if the nymphs are migrating into shore, you can simply use the shotgun approach that I showed you earlier with the strike indicator. But if you're gonna fish out in this deep heavy water like that, you got to remember that the prime lies are on the bottom. The fish won't come up through a lot of water to take the fly, so you have to get the fly right down on the bottom. A floating line is not very effective for doing that, even if the nymph is heavily weighted. So in this case, I might use a wet tip line. The forward 10 feet of this line is actually a sinking line. It's darker in color, as you can see. And the rest of the line, the lighter colored portion here, is a floating line. The advantage of using a line like this is, while this part sinks to get the fly down, the rest is floating and you can control it and handle it very easily. And the best technique for fishing these nymphs dead drift with the wet tip line is a lising ring lift. Suppose that I wanted to fish that slick in behind that rock there, remembering that the fish could be at the sides of the current. So I just cast up and across like that, just like we're gonna do the old lising ring lift, and let her come right down. Now, it's a good idea anytime you're doing the lising ring lift to watch the line. If it should jump upstream suddenly, maybe a fish has your fly. Cast it right up there. Let it sink and come down. The fly is going right down on the bottom now. Now it's bouncing along. I can feel it hit a rock occasionally. And when it gets right to this point, it'll start to swing across in the currents. And that's usually a very good time for the fish to take the fly. You'll feel them grab it. And they usually grab it quite hard in this fast water. So be ready. If your line should get downstream from it, you can just mend that floating portion very nicely like that. Get a little longer float. Hey! That old stone flying imp on that wet tip line did the job. Oh, it's not a big fish, but boy, it fights strong in that current. While the lising ring lift with a wet tip line is a good way to fish a nymph in heavy water like this, if the water is real deep, over about four feet, it just is not good enough to get the fly right on the bottom. So in this case, I'm going to use a full sinking line. Now this is a dark colored line usually, so you might have trouble seeing it. And to that, I'm gonna attach a very short leader, four feet or less, to make sure that fly stays right down on the bottom and a heavy tippet, make sure it's at least 3X. And then we'll just cast it the same way that we did with the lising ring lift. Now this is called the Brooks Method. It's just like the lising ring lift, except we're going to use a full sinking line. And as the line come down, comes down, lower the rod tip. Cast up, lift it like this, take the belly out of the line so the fly doesn't get dragged. Drop it like this and allow it to swing. One of the advantages of the Brooks method is that it keeps the fly close to the bottom even while it's swinging across. And in deep, fast water like this, that's very essential because the trout won't move more than a few inches to take that fly. When they do take it, they usually take it quite hard, so be ready. Adult stoneflies are easily recognized because they hold their wings flat along the top of their bodies. When they've mated, the females return to the river and lay their eggs. If there are many of these egg-laying adults on the water, then you can be sure that the trout will take them. The rise to a large stonefly adult is spectacular. It looks and sounds as if someone had just tossed a bowling ball into the river. Under these conditions, this is a good fly pattern to use, if you can get your hands to stop shaking long enough to tie it on. 
You can fish this adult imitation in any direction that you need to to get a good drift over the fish. I often use the induced rise method, that is, twitch the fly just a little bit after it hits the water and then let it float dead drift over the fish. This usually calls the fish's attention to the fly. You can use any of the methods that I showed you earlier for the caddis fly to get this induced movement and then dead drift. When there aren't any hatches, you can fish Ripley water like this with a dry fly. Bushy patterns such as this hairwing Adams and this royal wolf would be a good choice for this fast water. They float well and can be seen easily by both fish and fishermen. You might also choose a stonefly nymph or perhaps a generally suggestive pattern such as a woolly worm or muskrat nymph. You can also fish with a minnow imitation. In most trout streams, there are good populations of sculpins. These squat, toady-looking fish are bottom dwellers and are a favorite forage item of the trout. This fly, the muddler minnow, is an unparalleled imitation of the sculpin. It's an effective fly no matter where you fish. Here are some other patterns that represent or suggest bait fish. If you want to increase your chances of catching a big fish, try these minnow imitations in early morning and late evening. I use a shorter leader for fishing streamer flies than I use for fishing dry flies, so I have to change leaders. Let me show you the knots that will allow you to rapidly change leaders. The first knot I'm going to show you is the nail knot. Let's assume that this heavy rope is the fly line. This is the end of it. Put the fly line in your hand. Next, we're going to put a brass tube in there. Now, you can just get these small brass tubes at the local hobby store. Then, this blue rope will represent a piece of 25-pound test monofilament. Make a loop in the end of it like that and place it in your hand with a loop next to your little finger. Take the short end of the 25-pound mono and wrap around the fly line, around the tube, and around the long end of the mono. Each time you go around, put your finger on it so it doesn't slip. In the real mono, you go around about five times, and after you've made the five turns, pull the long end of the mono to draw out the loop. Pull it tight. Push the tube back down to the knot and insert the short end through the tube. Turn your hand over and pull out the tube, and there's the short end. Pull that tight. Pull the long end tight. Hold the long and short end and draw it down very, very tight. Then clip off the short end of the mono and the short end of the fly line, and the nail knot is complete. Now that we have the 25-pound mono tied onto the fly line, we're going to come out here about a foot and tie a perfection loop. Bend the short end back under the long end. Make one loop, pinch that. Go around, make another loop, pinch that. Go through between the two loops with the short end. Reach up through the first loop, grab the second loop, pull it down through, and draw the knot tight. Then cut off the short end right up against the knot. This piece of 25-pound test mono is called a connector, and it stays permanently attached to your fly line. When you want to change leaders, you tie another perfection loop in the end of your leader, put that loop over the loop of the connector, then pull the end of the leader up through the loop, and they're joined. When you need to change leaders, just back that out, Take off the old leader and put on the new one. Let me show you what it looks like with the real thing. There's the nail knot. There's the connector. There are the two perfection loops. And there's the leader. Well, now that I've got my leader changed, I can do a little streamer fishing. There are a couple of very good ways to fish streamers. First of these is the broadside float. For this, I normally use marabou flies or strip leech or some other fly that moves and undulates in the water. This tactic presents the fly to the fish in a broadside fashion so that the fish sees the entire silhouette of the fly. And since the fly is coming down the current broadside like this, it looks like a wounded minnow. The objective is just to cast out there, for the, cross the currents like this, and let the fly drift along. If you've got problems with drag, you can use that reach mend like this. Just let the fly drift. When it comes to the end of the drift, you can work a little bit, move it like this, like it's a crippled minnow darting and dashing in the current. In relatively uniform flowing water like this, this is perhaps the best technique for fishing a streamer fly. I use a floating line, and sometimes if the water's very deep, I may put on a wet tip to get the fly down a little bit further. The second streamer tactic I want to show you is a down and across approach. This is an especially good way to fish with a muddler minnow. I like to use it when I'm fishing a well-defined feeding lane, such as along the edge of that rock over there. 
just cast down and across and allow the currents to drag the fly back. Because the current bellies the line, it'll orient the fly sideways and again provide a sideways silhouette for the fish to see. And because the current's pulling the line, it'll look like a minnow that's trying to flee from the trout. If I'm fishing a well-defined current tongue like that, I'll make a cast, let it swing across, maybe jiggle the rod tip to make the fly pulse like a wounded minnow, then take one step down and repeat the process. And by doing this, simply fish right down that current tongue. And if there's a hungry trout waiting for a minnow there, he'll probably come and take a look at it. It doesn't matter if you're using the broadside approach or the down and across approach, but if you'll clamp a little piece of split shot on the leader and slide that right down against the head of the fly, that'll not only get the fly a little deeper, but it'll also give it a jigging action so that it moves like this in the water and looks more like a wounded minnow. Now let's see if we can get one. The techniques and concepts I've presented in this tape will help you catch more fish more consistently. Practice them and adapt them to the waters you fish. Whether the fish are taking dry flies or whether you have to go down after them with a nymph or a streamer, you'll be better prepared to enjoy the full measure of this fascinating sport of fly fishing. excitement you're after. Come fishing with the experts from 3M Scientific Anglers and learn ways to catch more and bigger trout on the fly. You'll learn where to find trout in a stream and ways to present the right fly with the perfect cast so you can catch the most elusive trout during hatch and non-hatch situations. Plus there's steelheading for 20 pound rainbows or going for the ultimate saltwater challenge. Let 3M Scientific Anglers bring home the excitement while you learn a lifetime of mastery techniques that will help you become the best fly fisherman you can be. There's no other sport like fly fishing. It can truly give you a lifetime of discovery and enjoyment. Whether you fish your own favorite stream, or travel the world with your fly rod, there's no end to what you'll learn. To help speed you along your path of discovery, Scientific Anglers from 3M has recruited some of the world's best fly fishermen to produce a complete learning system of videotape programs. Unlike simple how-to videos, the Scientific Anglers Mastery Series shows you more than just tips. It gives you an easy-to-learn formula for success to truly help you become a master angler. There are programs designed to give you a strong foundation of knowledge and skill. At the next level, the mastery system helps you integrate the skills and knowledge into sophisticated fly fishing strategies. And for the expert, there are challenge level programs that offer original and innovative techniques to help you master the most difficult fly fishing situation. Think of it as a learning path towards fly fishing mastery. The tape you just viewed is part of that path. In Doug Swisher's Trout Series, Scientific Anglers presents a four-part program that features a natural learning progression. First, there's basic fly casting, where you learn loop control and the principles of throwing a perfect straight line cast. Then you move on to advanced fly casting, Building your skills with more complex casting techniques, including curve and reach casts. Now you're ready for action as Strategies for Selective Trout shows you how to fish a hatch from bottom to top. And you'll almost feel the strike as Doug demonstrates ways to take difficult trout in non-hatch conditions. 
Finally, in advanced strategies for selective trout, Doug teaches you his most sophisticated methods, including ways to successfully fish the midge, how to unlock the mysteries of masking hatches and special streamer tactics to catch big trout. You'll be part of the action as you look through the eyes of the expert and learn the real whys behind the mastery of fly fishing for trout. While you're improving your streamside skills, you may also want to learn to tie your own flies. Gary Borger shows you a step-by-step -step approach to the basics of fly tying. And Doug Swisher demonstrates how to tie flies to match the hatch and his deadly attractor patterns. If you're hooked on catching the big ones, you've got to see the four-part series on fly fishing for Pacific Steelhead. Lonnie Waller and Jim Teeny will provide you with a complete arsenal of skills so that you can take these giant rainbows, even in the most challenging conditions. But that's not all. Scientific Anglers takes you south to watch world record holder Billy Pate demonstrate his secrets of success for hooking up and landing the ultimate fly fishing game. And if you love fishing, hunting, and other sports, Think of 3M as your total video resource for outdoor adventure. Explosive action. In-depth information. Incredible scenes. 3M Sportsman's Video Collection brings you the world of bass fishing with America's top anglers like Doug Hannon, Ricky Klein, and Al Linder, a comprehensive learning series that'll make you the best bass angler on your lake. You'll be glad you watch these programs when you catch the bass of a lifetime. The gentle beauty of a deep forest glade. The heart-pounding excitement of a trophy buck in rut. Going one-on-one -on -one with North America's most popular big game animal. That's what deer hunting's all about. And nobody brings you more in-depth information than true life action than the 3M Sportsman's Video Collection. The excitement of calling a bird into your gun satisfaction of making a clean shot and the companionship of a well-trained dog. If you like the challenge of upland game bird and waterfowl hunting, 3M Sportsman's video collection gives you the thrill of being there and the knowledge you need to master the sport. 